it seemed to uh, work. Well, I exactly what I forgot. Yeah, what I did. Yeah, exactly. 772, is that what you're doing? 766. Yeah, that's a good spot. The original idea of the project was to try to um, explore the concept of space and place as a dimension of performance. So we try to use state-of-the-art virtual reality and acoustic modelling uh, technology um, to try to reconstruct uh, the visuals and the acoustics uh, of lost performance spaces. We try to use this uh, to then situate a full um, CD's worth of material within what is essentially a reconstruction of an acoustic uh, from a particular um, space and a particular moment in time. Virtual reality is really just a simulated environment, uh, a realistic or a fantastical world that doesn't exist anywhere but inside the simulation. What we wanted to do in this project was to give people the experience of hearing historical music, not in a modern concert hall, but in the sort of performance environments for which the music was written and which today just no longer exist. Now, it would be prohibitively expensive to build physical reconstructions of those spaces. Virtual reality, on the other hand, lets us do just that and create immersive virtual auditoria. I think it's fair to say that I didn't need much persuading to do this project. Historical projects are what we've always done. We've done a series of discs um, highlighting aspects of music's relation to late medieval alabaster. We've done um, a project on music in the Hundred Years' War. Uh, we did a number of projects on music at the Court of Savoy. So really building out from that into trying to reconstruct as closely as possible the sound of a lost medieval building was very much in the tradition of what we do and I was very keen to get involved. We decided to situate our recording in Linlithgow Palace, quite specifically within the chapel of Linlithgow Palace. Uh, this is a really interesting venue because it presents some interesting challenges. As it currently stands, there's no ceiling, no roof, um, it's lacking windows in their entirety. Um, so not only does it not look anything like uh, how it once did when it, it was once um, a very magnificent building, uh, obviously it's not really a space in which one can perform today, uh, not least because you'll get very wet. So much of the sound just escapes out of the space. Um, so we thought it was a really interesting challenge to work with um, a building that required so much reconstruction. Um, it's also a very important building. It used to be the great pleasure palace of the kings and queens of Scotland. Uh, so it was situated between um, the capital of Edinburgh um, and the more common um, home for the royal family in Stirling. Um, and it was essentially where they would get away from uh, either place uh, for more relaxation. It's where they often spent the most important um, Christian feast days of the year as well and we know that they took musicians with them. So we thought it would make uh, both an interesting challenge for the reconstruction and also quite an important venue that we know was the site for important uh, musical celebrations. The virtual reality experience effectively lets people step into the past and to see and hear a lost world of performance. Now, we've worked with architectural records and historians to recreate the visual interiors of the spaces, and we've painstakingly pieced together programmes of music that would have been performed inside of them. 
perhaps as a mirror to the reconstruction work we've had to do on the fragmentary building, uh, we've had to do quite a bit of that to the music as well. The music of pre-Reformation Scotland is extraordinarily fragmentary. Uh, we have really very little that survives. We do, of course, have the Carver Choir book, which runs right up to the Reformation. Uh, but this is a rather later work than the period um, at which we were trying to reconstruct the chapel, uh, which was around about the turn of the 16th century. So in the end, what we did uh, was use the earliest gathering from the Carver Choir book. So that uh, consists of three mass cycles, two anonymy, which bookend Dufay's famous Lomar May Maymass. Both of these anonymy are incredibly interesting works. Um, they are clearly from the mid to late 15th century, um, and they've been variously described as English or continental. Uh, we're increasingly convinced that they are in fact both Scottish uh, for various different uh, liturgical and stylistic reasons. We've managed to identify the uh, Cantus Firmus of one of the mass cycles uh, and have been able to show that it's actually for St Catherine, which is quite exciting. And it's this mass cycle that we've decided to use as the basis for this CD. That sense of space that sound gives you, that exquisite sensation of being enveloped in sound, really derives from a few different things. And first of all, there's the correlation between what we see and what we hear. That's a very powerful relationship. And so it was important that we created a compelling visual environment to complement the sonic one. Because our ears sit at either sides of our heads, Sound reaches each ear at slightly different times and arrives with slightly different loudness. The effect is subtle, but our ears are very sensitive and they can decode that information with remarkable precision. And as the sound travels to us, typically it reflects off and is absorbed by the different surfaces and the materials in the room, which can subtly alter the frequency balance of the sound and add a reverberant quality as these different reflections fuse together to create a diffuse halo of sound. Now you might have noticed that as you move from say a, a carpeted space with lots of furnishings like a bedroom into a more reflective, maybe a tiled space like a bathroom. The bathroom will tend to sound brighter and livelier because of those reflections. It's one of the reasons why we're all such great singers in the shower. So the first step that we took to recreate the acoustics was to work with our partners Historic Environment Scotland, who went into Linlithgow Palace Chapel and did something called a LiDAR scan, which creates an incredibly accurate three-dimensional model of the space that it's in. And I put, imported it into modelling software, which allowed me to keep the dimensions but simplify it so we could then uh, manipulate it within virtual reality. And it's from that simplified model that we started adding layers of, that were lost in history, looking at things like the position of the roof. Obviously, we know the windows were there, but there was stone beneath the windows, which was now missing. And then if there was a loft present at the time that we were modelling or if that was added after. Once we um, got the structure, we then had to research what objects would be present within the, the space at that time. So we worked with uh, Historic Environment Scotland's sort of historians and their architects to try and understand what was going on in the year 1512. So we've added in a table, we've all got drapes, we've got an altar, we've got thrones, there's also candles and chandeliers. So it was really looking into what sort of objects we could import in. And then once we'd researched these, we had to research the materials that the structures were uh, constructed of. So the plaster on the wall, what sort of the clay tiles that were on the floor, the glass in the windows, Course the drapes that were covering the walls and covering the ex exits, which have a big effect on the acoustics. Once we've then got all the objects and what they were constructed of, I then had to go and find the acoustic properties or the best estimate available of what these different models of these different materials were.
Well, it would be idle to say that um, this project didn't bring challenges that we've not been used to in prior uh, things we've done. In order to use our reconstructed acoustic, we had to record in an anechoic chamber. Uh, for some of us, it was a bit less of a shock than for others because the previous year we'd um, performed some music and recorded some music for Historic Scotland in Edinburgh in and also in a, an anechoic chamber. The anechoic chamber is a unique type of room and it's designed to have minimal acoustic reflections. It's got these large sound absorbing foam wedges around all walls. Three days essentially being shut up um, in a space surrounded by pointed foam, rather like an Iron Maiden as somebody pointed out. Being in an anechoic chamber is disorientating and a little unworldly. It's very unpleasant to be in for a long period of time. I suppose one might compare being in an anechoic chamber to being in some kind of audio straitjacket. One needed to find an extra level of concentration, maintaining not just customary accuracy in terms of rhythm, pitch, tonal delivery, pronunciation and ensemble singing, but also certain other areas which became more important under the microscope of recording in this space. Over time, you stop focusing on the sounds around you and become much more conscious of the internal sounds of your own body, particularly the blood rushing through your ears. When breathing in, it became essential not to make any noise at all. And when delivering consonants, we had to make sure that the delivery was both rapid and uniform. Having a patient producer was also very helpful. If you think about the reverb that lasts in, say, cathedrals, which can be several seconds long, in an anechoic chamber, it's just a fraction of a second and then the sound just disappears. And that's what we really need, so we can then import the acoustics of the spaces that we've recreated in virtual reality and create the sound that uh, you want to hear today. I can't emphasise enough the importance of their contribution. Not only does their singing really animate the music, but they did it in some very challenging circumstances. It wasn't particularly challenging to persuade the musicians to be part of this project. Many of them I've worked with for many years, um, so we're pretty used to how we operate together. Um, I explained exactly what was going to happen, so no one was under any illusions. And I think, um, you know, once they decided what was going to happen and were clear about it, um, we, were, we had a pretty straightforward run at the thing. Um, it was, though, extremely concentrated and uh, it's quite exhausting, both physically and mentally. But I think the results have proved that the experiment was very much worthwhile. <laughs> Once, once you're on your own, it's just going to sound so some pretty. Uh, from here, it feels as if it's busy. This is, I think, really about as close as you can get to musical time travel. <laughs>